I don't know who leaves the roaches. Did this happen at your house with your kids? Uh, no, kids don't leave the roaches around. I'm not a big... How old are your kids? Five and three. And so I'm, when uh, will you start them on marijuana? <laughs> I was never a big pot guy. I could tell. No, no, I don't mean that as an insult. <laughs> I know that sounded bad. I could tell. <laughs> But this could be the night. It could. It you know, could. It I mean, could. I, you never liked blowjobs before that first guy sucked your dick, right? <laughs> and, I mean, I'm just saying the rumors I've heard. <laughs> no. Um, but you, not, even in high school, you didn't... Uh, no, no. No cigarettes, no pot. Uh, and then you probably don't want to start with this one. No, that looks lethal. Um, uh, and, and, hey, this is... I don't do, like, uh, drinking or any type of drugs when I'm doing these things. Doing what thing? Like if, if I'm doing a podcast or a, a show. This isn't a podcast. Oh, I don't I mean, know what they the, told you. This, this is, is just a, a little get together. You don't want to drink at all? No. no I mean, no, like, no, not even soda? No, I got water. It, just water? Yeah. Wow, Jesus. And you're Italian? Yeah. <laughs> you know, your name, I have to say, always sounded to me like an explorer. I've never heard that before. No, I'm sure. <laughs> Why would anyone have thought it before? But it does. Sebastian Maniscalco sounds to me like it would go in with Columbus or, uh, you know, Vasco da Gama. Your name could have been Vasco da Gama. I it feel like that could have switched out easily. Um, Bartolome Diaz, um, Balboa. You see what I'm saying? It just you sounds like you that name I could see as an if they if I had learned that name in history class, you know, it's like in 1498, Sebastian, <laughs> <Discovered. Sco. laughs> yeah, it was the first one to go around the Cape of Good Hope and uh, discover, you know, I don't know. Wakanda. No, uh, it, now that you mention it, it does sound like I thank explored you. the high seas. And discovered a lot of stuff back in the day. Who uh, who are your favorite explorers? Um, well, um, you know what? I'm not versed on a lot of uh, explorers. Oh, I you was must have a favorite. I was going to say uh, Vespucci. Is that an explorer? Vespucci. We, Americo the, the Vespucci. Oh, Amerigo Vespucci. Yes, the, <laughs> yes, you're right. Yeah, he was. A, people uh, have the thought that he was just a map maker because that's how we got the name America mm -hmm. from, obviously, his first name, Amerigo. But he was an explorer himself, probably just for the pussy. Okay. See, I this... think back then, I think explorers were very much the rock stars of their era. You know, like I think they had groupies and, uh, you know, your latest expedition was like your latest album, I think. I mean, I, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just, you know, these are the things I think about when I masturbate, you know, about uh, the 15th century. You have to like, hey, if you see a hot chick in a movie, then it takes place in the 15th century. It's like, how could I be get with that chick? Oh, I'd be an explorer, of course. <laughs> and then, then, you know, they just, they, they throw themselves at the explorers. Maybe I should start smoking pot. Jesus you Christ. When you're, when, when you're thinking about explorers on a day-to-day. -day. Well, no, it's just your name. <laughs> It's just your name. <laughs> it is the name of an explorer. But, um, so, yeah. I met you, you're not going to remember this. I was a, um, I don't even know what you call it. You did a thing called Mob Week on, uh, on your old show. And Mob Week on Politically Incorrect. Yeah. That was in the days when, uh, it was 1999. It was in the days when TV took ratings three times a year. So you had to do something special during ratings month. So all the shows would do things like travel the show, something to get people to like, to goose the numbers. Like, oh, they're in New York doing mob week. And what were you, the guy that they hired to hit me? We, did, we were in a warehouse, me, you, and a comedian named Joey Diaz, and it was a promo for sure. the, the mob week. And that's, and I thought, like, I hit gold when I got this part. I just got out here in 98 and 99. I get cast to do a mobster in your show 
for a promo. I called home. I'm like, this is it. It's happening. <laughs> I'm in a warehouse with Mar and we're doing a, a Mob Week promo. So that's uh, that's where I crossed and paths. You, and me. you were just hired to because you are the I was just Italian. very typical Italian. You are the epitome of Italianness. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if I rented you in the street, I swear to God, the first thing out of my mouth would not be, hey, that guy's Italian. I don't, I don't even, I mean, I know where you talk about it a lot in your act, so I understand that, but I don't even see it in you. You don't see it. I see an explorer. <laughs> <laughs> I see a guy in the bow of a ship um, with scurvy. That's what I see. <laughs> I do not see it. But no, I understand you're Italian. And, uh, um, you know, as, as the senator said in The Godfather Part Two. The Italians are a wonderful people. Oh, they are wonderful. And we're so happy they've come out to this clean country. Do you ever see The Godfather Part oh, yeah. Two? Oh, yeah. That, that, that speech? That, well, that hypocrisy is so great of when the senator, played by G.D. Spradlin, G.D. Spradlin, one of the great character actors, also the coach in North Dallas 40, and also in Apocalypse Now, he's like the guy who says, you have to go on a mission and terminate with extreme prejudice. But he, uh, he, when he meets Michael Corleone in private, he's like, I don't like you. I don't like your oily people coming out to this nice, clean country and bringing with your silky suits and your, you know, he just could not be more of a put down <laughs> against the entire Italian nation. And then, of course, when he's giving, when he's accepting the check, he's <laughs> my good friend Vato Corleone. <laughs> and then when he's, and then, and then of course when he's in Congress and he has to like excuse himself because it's a little awkward that he'd be uh, in this hearing about Michael Corleone. And the Italian people are a fine people who have, you know, done so many great things for our country. It's just. Well, it's Didn't he later get caught with like a prostitute and they killed the prostitute and he woke Correct. up? Correct. In yeah. the movie, yeah, yes. Yeah. They set him up and then Tom Hagen comes in and he's just like, <sighs> he's, he's got his shirt off, you know, he's like, he doesn't know what happened. They must have drugged him too. And, you know, she's dead and Tom Hagen comes in and says, we'll take care of this. This is a girl. She has no family. Woo! <laughs> I just got to say, those mobsters were, boy, they were... Next to explorers, <laughs> tough people, ruthless. So where do, where do you live now? I live right up the street. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. L literally? Yeah. Literally. We won't mention like, names, but like, like, a, like a mile away. A mile away. Eight and how long have you lived there? I uh, moved there right before the pandemic. So uh, I moved before in, that, you were in New York. Uh, no, I was, I've been here since '98. So oh, right. I used to live on uh, like Melrose, Fairfax, like West Hollywood area. And sure. then um, it's moved the, up here. That's the progression. Yeah. As you've you've got this big blossoming career, you're not going to fucking still live on Melrose <laughs> next to the Schmata store. <laughs> um, you're moving on up yeah, to the east yeah. side. No, it's to a deluxe apartment. <laughs> so you like it? Yeah, I do. Um, I mean, you like being you and... I like all this uh, success, and I'm I'm having a trouble kind of adjusting to the. Yeah, you seem kind of down. Well, <laughs> <laughs> is it me, <laughs> guy, with all your, you know, I, this is my problem. I I don't know necessarily how to enjoy myself at this point in my career. That's what I'm getting. <laughs> <laughs> a lot, and, and I think I have your answer right here, but you won't do it. Uh, I've got I've got it in my hand. I've got it on the table. Um, I got it everywhere. But no, the, um, the problem with me is I'm like an overanalyzer. I got I overthink things. Me too. Yeah, and I'm, I'm having a hard time being in the moment, enjoying where I am in life because I'm constantly thinking down the road. I'm, I'm constantly thinking that my, my last gig I do is the last gig I'm ever going to do. It's not that, you know what, this all is not the worst possible thing. Overanalyzing, yeah, can it be a bad thing? It can, but it's also, um, I'll, I'll, you know what, I'm going to keep that trait. I think I'm going to want to analyze because I like to keep trouble at bay. Yeah. I like to keep it far away. How do I do that? I analyze things. As opposed to what, being a stumbling idiot, just <laughs> walking down a dark hallway and bumping into things? No. I think, so I don't think 
overanalyzing, despite the, the drawbacks that it does have, is, is the worst possible thing. So I don't think you should feel bad about feeling bad. Oh, I've never had to put that way before. Exactly. But you see, well, you never talk to anybody like me, and you should have. <laughs> well, you seem like—I uh, mean, I don't know you, but just on the surface, you seem like a relaxed guy. You're kind of confident where you are in life right now. Yeah. And uh, I'm at a point where you know I've got two small kids, five and three, trying to bring them up in Los Angeles. Always uh, kind of uh, pining well, over everything. I mean, of course, kids change every dynamic, one hundred percent. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, yeah. No, yeah. definitely. And I'd say that as someone who's never had kids, but I've seen them around. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't enjoy them. Um, I never have, um, but I see them. I see the way they're brought up. Um, what, what's the why? What, what's the problem with them for you? Well, Bill Clinton used to say about abortion that it should be safe, legal, and rare. And I feel the same about children. They should be safe, legal, reluctantly, yes, but rare. And, and certainly not in places where adults go. And when I was a kid, now, I don't know, what are you, like 50? 50. going to be 50. There you go. Well, welcome aboard. <laughs> welcome <laughs> aboard to the second half of, the, of your century of life. Hopefully we'll make it a century. It is the normal lifespan, I think, of a human if we're not poisoned and uh, with toxicity. There are many people who live to 100. That is, I think, and I think an elephant also. Um, live to 100? I think so, but I forget. <laughs> Get it? <laughs> elephant. Anyway, but um, 50 is, well, that, see, I think your generation is actually the last sane generation. You're Gen X. Mm -hmm. Okay. After that, it goes off the cliff quickly. And when it gets to Gen Z, I mean, it's just the insanity. I mean, I know you share these views because I watch your specials, yeah, yeah, yeah. which are very funny. What, what's the one that's on now? Is, is it me? Yeah. Is it me? Yes. It's constantly walking around. Yeah, I love the tux. You like the tux? I, I love that idea. I mean, I, I love a tux. Um, I love old schoolness, you know, and bringing back that Rat Packy kind of Vegas thing is certainly something with, if it could happen, the accompanying mindset in a lot of ways, which is, you know, ring a ding ding, mm -hmm. let's live, you yeah. know? I mean, obviously, see the younger generation, you can't say that because, oh yes, Frank Sinatra, but he also was bad with women. Everybody's bad with something, you know? First of all, people evolve, mm -hmm. humans evolve. You know, you, you can't expect, they think that you can look back at the past and judge it by the mores of the present, which even their own generation will not stand up to in 50 years. Mm -hmm. We're doing things now that they'll hate. Yeah. So, you know, the younger generation probably doesn't wanna go back to the Rat pack eat times, and yeah, it wasn't good in some ways, but, there was a general feeling to it. I, I, I think Vegas was better when the mob ran it. I do too. And I just feel like, I don't know, d does that come back around? Do we see a Vegas in 10, 20 years where people are dressed in, you know, suits, cocktail dresses? I mean, Steve Wynn tried to implement that in, at the Wynn Hotel when he first opened it. No kids, no strollers. Guys had to wear a jacket and women had to have cocktail dresses. And that lasted 48 hours, and, and uh, you know, right. they were walking through the, the casino with a thong on. So uh, <laughs> it's like, yeah. I don't know, I, I, I feel like, yeah, there, there, was yeah. Some, there was some, those times were whatever. Everybody, everybody in every generation was doing something that was probably not looked upon as good. But I'm just saying, how could you deny putting on a nice jacket, looking the part when you go out? Now you go anywhere, and it seems like it's just it's just. Well, you, I mean, evolving. that's interesting that you mentioned that. I did not realize that Steve Wynn did that. Mm. Do you know what year that was? Uh, that was he, I, years ago. Was nah, it? he opened the hotel around 15, 20 years ago. I want to say two thousand four, two thousand five. Like yeah, the Wynn, the yeah. Wynn and the Encore, the Wynn and the Encore. Yeah, right. So, and there were signs all over the casino saying that this is what happened. Well, he's also the guy who, when he had the didn't he have the Bellagio? Yeah. For, okay had the exhibit of like art art's greatest hits mm -hmm. they had uh, they had a, a museum yeah like and it was just the ones that you know 
no, it wasn't the Mona Lisa because you couldn't get that on loan. But they had Van Gogh's, like, you know, uh, Starry, Starry Night in there. Yeah. I mean, they had some major artworks. Mm -hmm. And that was his way of saying, yes, let's, as you were saying, let's raise the bar. Mm -hmm. Let's have a little class here. Um, I mean, I thought that was brilliant. And, of course, as much as that cost, the thing out front was genius because it cost like 10 cents. And everybody loved that even more, which was the tape of Pavarotti. They played, and then the, uh -huh. the fountains with lights. So what do you need? Water, lights, and a disc. Yeah. And it blew everybody's minds. And they were like, fuck Van Gogh. <laughs> Look at this. He made water shoot in the air. Yeah. He's the man is a genius. So I think that's your answer about, like, um, you know, trying to get the masses to um, put on a, a nice coat and tie. I don't think that's ever going to no? happen again. I not not I, on I, our, I have hopes that that might come around, but who knows? I don't know where this is going. Not, not on a mass level. That's the thing. I mean, you could do it for a select group, yes. But they don't want that in a casino. They want throngs of people losing money. You want the biggest, you know, they, what they call it, the drop at the table. I think you probably know from working Vegas. They don't really care about you as a performer, certainly not what you're doing, as long as it brings in people. But even that is not what they care about. They care about what the people who you bring in do mm -hmm. when your show ends. Yeah. And what do you think that is? Well, I mean, listen, they're looking- Gamble. Yeah, they're looking gamble, the <laughs> food, the nightclubs, the rooms. Not the nightclubs, not the food, not at gamble. That's what their business is. That's, you're selling nothing. There is no product and people are giving you your, their money. That's a good business to be in. Mm -hmm. They're, you're just selling air and hope. Food, you have to actually provide food. <laughs> you know, that's have to pay you to tell jokes. <laughs> but the gambling, it's everything. Everything is there to funnel them to lose their house and mortgage and their child's future at the tables and that's all you're there for. I agree. I agree. But you yourself, did you play Vegas when there was hints of the mob still there? I, when I was 26, I opened for Diana Ross at Caesar's Palace. Talk about thrilled to get a job. But it was what I call the dead ball era in Vegas. It was after the... Rat Pack days, mm -hmm. but before Vegas had reinvented itself as a place where young people would be interested in going. I mean, I was there for two weeks, 26 years old. I, I don't remember seeing any pretty girls. No, so they, it was just older. It was it was almost like what I guess Miami was like at a certain point. You know that kind of um, the acts were fairly octogenarian. I mean, they were. Let's just say they were veteran performers. I don't think ever, everyone was in their 80s, but, you know, it was like Pat Cooper. I remember I, I went and saw as many of the comedians, Buddy Hackett, mm. you know, um, and Diana Ross was like the, the, that was the, Caesars at that moment was the biggest casino by far. That was the shit. Mm -hmm. And she was the biggest star. I think the number I think she was getting a week was $400,000. That's pretty big in the 80s. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so you had no hints of like uh, Mr. Ma, right this way. Do you, no, you know, well, here's certainly some cash, no. You know, like certainly this. at that era, no one was saying to me, Mr. Ma, anything or right this way. <laughs> I was the sacrificial lamb that went on stage while people filed in to see the great yeah. Diana Ross, yeah, yeah. and she was great and is great. I loved her, um, still do. Um, but uh, no, there was there was none of that. And I don't. I mean, I would not have been privy to that. But I think it was phasing out anyway. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, the heyday was the 50s and 60s. I mean, that's, of course, the, the, the plot of uh, Godfather 2 that we were just talking about is, you know, part of it is Bugsy Siegel opening Vegas. I mean, yeah. him, Hy Hyman Roth has that great speech mm -hmm. where he talks about how Mo Green got shot in the eye and there's not a plaque or a signpost. This was a man of guts and vision. He invented the city of Las Vegas and we don't honor him. You know, that era, I think, had pretty much passed by the time I got there. The problem was they, they were fumfering around a while before they realized that 
they were sitting on the gold mine of, this is the one place in America where you can be an adult, you can be politically incorrect, you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Yeah. So when they kind of went, to, they tried to be like family friendly and it's like, that's not what you're, that's not who you are and you shouldn't want to be that. You have, you have this almost all to yourself. People act in Vegas in ways they don't the rest of the country when they're home. Yeah. And that is an awesome thing to be selling. They should actually be doing better than they are. Uh, well, I don't know. They're, they, from what I'm seeing, it's constantly packed, uh, especially after the pandemic. Macau um, makes Macau, China mm -hmm. makes ten times what Las Vegas does. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's Sorry crazy. You started down this road, now, aren't you? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> what am I doing here? Uh, Let's go to Macau. Yeah, <laughs> no, ten times. That's crazy. Yeah, so. With probably no entertainment. I mean, who the hell's going there? I mean, you don't see any, any I don't hear anybody going to win Macau. Well, they're look. probably stars of China, Chinese singers. You know, I mean, uh, I, don't, I don't know, but it could very well be. First of all, they just take gambling much more seriously. Yeah. So it's probably a little more like, I'm sure you've played Indian casinos. Yes. They also can be kind of like light on the atmosphere and <laughs> you know that it's just like this is a big big <laughs> barn and we have gambling here and that's kind of it and i'm thrilled that they hire comedians you know i remember had some great times there but yeah it's not like vegas there's no fountains yeah. going off there's no pirate ships there's no tigers <laughs> there's no homosexual german magicians it's just it's just a place to, to gamble. I don't know what Macau is like, and I'm not going to find out. But the Asian culture is much more um, driven by uh, fate, the belief in fate, as opposed to Western man, who is more of, uh, I can create my own destiny. So given that as the background of their philosophical underpinnings, it is probably why gambling, you know, it's just fate. It's if it's if I'm lucky tonight, <laughs> I'm gonna make a fortune. Yeah. But they they do love their gambling and they do it a lot. And yeah, you should play Macau. Well, I mean, that's I, I had I had noticed you go to the Wynn Hotel in in Las Vegas and in the in the um, shower, the toiletries says soap, and then I'm assuming it says soap in Chinese. Uh, and <laughs> does it look like it's in Chinese? <laughs> well, yeah, it's it's Chinese. So I'm like, how much are the Chinese dropping here that they that they had a meeting to say we got to start writing the soap in Chinese to make these people happy? Right. So yeah, no, they take their game a lot extremely seriously. Yeah. With HelloFresh, you get farm-fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. You've got New Year's goals. Number one, stop eating like a pig and HelloFresh is here to help. Skip the grocery store parking garage road rage and take control of your time and budget with delicious recipes delivered right to your door. HelloFresh lets you cut back on expensive takeout and get started with HelloFresh. You'll love how fast, easy, and affordable it is to whip up a restaurant-quality meal right in your own kitchen. And if you have a date, you can trick them into saying you made it from scratch. Eating well is top of mind this month, and you always get top quality with HelloFresh. Ingredients travel from the farm to you in less than seven days, so you know they're fresh. I know that my personal chef felt incredibly threatened when I whipped up a delicious meal in my kitchen. Sorry, pal, this is a bad time to tell you you're fired. I kid the chef. But HelloFresh does make cooking top quality meals fast and easy. Go to HelloFresh.com slash random21 and use code random21 for 21 free meals plus free shipping. Again, that's HelloFresh.com random and use code 21 for 21 free meals plus free shipping. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Club Random is brought to you by the audio marketing gurus at Radioactive Media. They say the definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over and expect different results. As a small business, the more successful you are with Google and your SEO marketing, the more expensive it becomes. 
That's because you're focusing on the same places as your competitors. Ask yourself, what are you doing this year that's different to market your business and to make it stand out, resulting in higher profits? Why not harness the power of audio marketing by partnering with shows like this to drive new business online or in person? The team at Radioactive Media can get you there the fastest. Radioactive Media has over 35 years of experience in the field of audio marketing. They've been doing it since there was audio or marketing. They create campaigns airing on all things audio, podcasts, terrestrial, satellite, and streaming radio. They can create a custom campaign for your company's needs, just like they've done for hundreds of successful businesses, including ones you've seen here like Signal Wire, Heat Holders, and Wine Enthusiast. Radioactive Media is a boutique agency, and they operate very hands-on. Trust me, I know, they came backstage in Hawaii and bugged my friends and I practically had to get a restraining order to get them to leave. Just kidding, guys, it was fun. Radioactive Media believes so much in the power of audio marketing, they've even using it themselves. Right here, right now. Contact them today at RadioactiveMedia.com. That's RadioactiveMedia.com or by texting the word RANDOM to 511-511. Text RANDOM to 511-511 today and start killer marketing with audio now. Message and data rates may apply. You know, there's, there's plenty of Chinese billionaires now. I mean, it's not a safe place to be a billionaire. Mm -hmm. Even uh, Jack Ma, you yeah. know. Wasn't he missing for a while? Yes. <laughs> I mean, look. I certainly have a lot of things to say about America these days that aren't terribly flattering, but we don't quite do that. And that's not even the worst place to be a, an uppity businessman. That would be in Russia, yeah. where they constantly are just pushing them out a window. I mean, you would think that with this kind of scrutiny on you, and you, you already have a reputation <laughs> for someone who pushes a lot of people out of windows, at this moment you're involved in a war, that you would just keep doing it. I, it's just, you kind of got to admire if you're a gangster, Putin on that level, because he's just like, yeah, I will push you out a fucking window. <laughs> and I don't really care who knows it. In fact, I kind of like it that everyone does know it. And I will boldfacedly say, you know, I have asked for legislation in the Duma to fix our problem with faulty windows because <laughs> people, it must be the railings have to be adjusted. The floors are slippery by these windows. I am <laughs> imploring our Congress to do so. And he will just make that speech and no one will, you know, nobody checks him. Yeah. Although we're kind of like, it's actually amazing the way that you follow that war in Ukraine. I don't follow a lot of current events when it comes to world affairs, and I'm amazed. <laughs> You're a very limited man, Sebastian. <laughs> I don't I, have I, I, I don't have like a plethora of knowledge. Put it this way: you're, you're rattling what? off movie lines. Sure. You're you're you know explorers. Explorers. You know oh. the inner workings of Ukraine and Russia. Right. I don't know nothing. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you certainly know how to make people laugh. <laughs> That's what I concentrate all and my you're, time on. You're a you're a, a fucking master craftsman at it. You d deserve all this you're getting well, because you. you're great at that. And you know what? Not everybody has to be a Renaissance man. It's so much better actually to be good at one, really great at one thing, <clears throat> than to be sort of good at a whole bunch of other things. I mean. Well, like a guy like you, you seem like you know a lot of stuff. What are you doing? Are you reading? Are you talking to people? Like, where's, no. this, where, where's a, the information a, coming from? A fairy flies by <laughs> once a day and whispers in my ear, no, Sebastian. Like you that, just know things. I, I, I don't know a I lot mean, of these things. I that, know, because... Like, what's, what are you a, doing on a daily basis? You know what? I think it's just a little... A lot of it is just the brief like decade and a half difference in our ages at some point i guess say your generation is the last sane one maybe but they may be the the first one that just well they kind of like just went ah fuck it with the education <laughs> i mean now they just have complete i don't know what you think your kids are learning in school but i'm almost sure it's nothing i mean they do still teach them how to read barely um but okay they can do that and maybe math no not even math anymore because they got calculators and they can't tell you what eight times seven is i mean we had to we had to learn a times table yeah, did yeah. you have to do yeah, eight times seven fifty six yeah 
But I mean, first of all, it was just part of something they did in school. Like they didn't let you out the door of high school unless you had a sort of basic understanding of the world and our place in it and what happened before us and basic things. I mean, I didn't like math or biology, but I fucking sat through them because I had to. And we were afraid if we didn't do well that there would be terrible repercussions, like getting left back. Yeah. You know, they didn't, nowadays they would never use that term, by the way. No. Left back because it's way too... It's negative. Yes, it's way too, oh my God, you're stigmatizing people. And it's like, yes, good. I was worried about being stigmatized. Yeah. As a, oh, a word I can't say, <laughs> but it begins with R. But if I said it, then the whole show would be canceled or something. Uh, yes. And that was good. It's not, it's not bad to be a little scared. I agree. Um, speaking of being canceled, are you at all worried about that for yourself? Like, do you uh, edit yourself when you're, or, or is, it, is it? I mean, that's, a, of course, a question I have to answer honestly and say everybody ed edits themselves to some degree. I just did it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because there was a word I wanted to use that we should be able to use, but you can't. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, and it's a shame because, you know, America, there's just no other word that really gets at how dumb America is. And, and when people do dumb things, and by the way, in private, everybody uses it because it's almost indispensable with how stupid America is that you can't not, you can stop yourself from saying, oh my God, that is so... Blank. Um, but what was the question? The <laughs> <laughs> oh, do I edit myself? Well, well, you seem to be on a show that's like yeah. you know, tackling some topics that are you know controversial. So I often wonder when I'm watching, you know, is this guy like, is he just free flowing thought, or is it is it is it like is he holding back? I because I, I, I don't really see that you're holding back. It's just kind I'm, of I'm pure not, I'm never. I don't hold back. Um, and, and I have the scars to prove it, but. Look, uh, there are things that I, it's interesting the way the milieu has so much to do with how something is received and what is allowed. I often have this uh, joking sort of tease play with my boyfriend Seth MacFarlane about this because he gets away with things because it's a fucking cartoon that just make me, I'm like, if I ever said that, and he laughs at me and uh, because <laughs> he's right. Mm. That's how you do You put it in a cartoon character's mouth and people accept it. Well, in a similar way, like I can say things here that I would never say on real time because real time is different. It's, just, it's not, well, it is better. I mean, I say this all the time. I mean, that's my real job. This, this is fun and it's different and it's as real as it gets. But real time is no less real. It's just that that is a network television show and I'm in a suit and a tie and I'm talking to a senator and a, or a governor or something like that. There is a little, and the audience is, you know, they're pay, it's a pay cable number. There is a little more appropriate decorum or just, it's not pulling punches. It's just, you know, it's nuance, you know, something the world has forgotten about so much, nuance. But yeah, so um, if you call that editing, yes, but even with my editing, I'm a thousand times more honest than the next guy. <laughs> oh, yeah. No. I mean, Howard Stern is honest also in his way. We, we unfortunately disagree about a lot of things now, like because, not a lot, but like COVID. You know, he's, he's very, very concerned about COVID. And I think the whole thing was ridiculously handled and completely overblown. And uh, the, the responsibility for it was misplaced, and blah, blah, blah. But that aside, you know, there's just not a lot of, um, yeah, there's just not a lot of people who will take on those issues that could get you canceled. Yeah. And that's almost all I'm attracted to. <laughs> it's all that seems to be like worth kind of talking about. I want to talk about this, you know, my criteria when we're choosing an editorial for the end of the show is don't ever pitch me something that anyone else is already saying because it's been done mm -hmm. you know i i'm not i don't go i don't want i'm not interested in the obvious you know and i'm i'm much more rather take the blows and do it my way <laughs> as your boyfriend frank sinatra <laughs> would say 
Is that like your theme song? Yeah. You must love Frank. <laughs> oh, I love Frank. I, I do love too. Frank. It's just uh, I love Frank. I love Elvis. Elvis was good too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, I, I just think the entertainment back then was a little different in the sense that I don't know, it was a little bit more original and and I felt like you had to really be good to be on TV and film. I just feel like right now it just seems like entertainment and real life are like all in in, in one. Well, yeah. yeah, I mean, a lot of people have pointed out that um, Andy Warhol's famous dictum that everyone in the future will be famous for 15 minutes kind of came true. Yeah. With, I mean, we're on a podcast, you, you do a podcast. Um, there's four million other people doing it. Yeah, this is like, you know, we're doing it here, and then there's two guys in their garage I mean, in Cincinnati doing it too. I'm, I'm saying, know? but it would be like if in, you know, the 70s, there was Johnny Carson and Merv Griffin and four million other guys <laughs> who, who were like doing their version of The Tonight Show. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, of course, the, the numbers matter, you know, so, I mean, uh, but it is, if you're saying it's more diffuse, yes, I mean, things have been uh, diluted in a big way because of reality television. And also, you know, some of it exposed people who were in show business and people thought they should be lionized and put on a pedestal and just showed, oh, wow, that's not that different <laughs> than the Real Housewives or something. And, yeah. and maybe that's more entertaining. And, and it just showed that acting, most of it, not that hard. On the highest level, I would say acting is some, yes, it's, it's a great craft. But a lot of what you see in acting in television, sitcoms and so forth, eh, it's not that different than a reality show mm -hmm. where they're just, you know, just go out there and here's the scene, you know, because we know they're not really reality shows. I mean, they have a script, not a script word for word, but just, a, you know, yeah. okay, you're mad at her because she flirted with your ex husband or whatever goes on. I don't never seen one of those shows, but I assume that's what they're, I, I doubt if they're talking about the Ukraine war. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't think so. I think, <laughs> you know, Bethany, I think if I, if Putin can hold on to the Donetsk region that, no, that's not what's happening there. But what is happening is that they're basically doing a, a little play, which is what a sitcom is. They just don't have the word for word, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sure the producer says, suggests, I've seen this, you know, I know this is what happens, right? Yeah. And then they just act it. And it's not that different from people who got awards and are officially actors. And I think people see that and they go, oh, okay, I got to get a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Now, what about your family on a reality show? I, I, mm, no. I, not, <laughs> I knew the answer to that. Not, but I, not my speed. Can you imagine? No. Now, just imagine. What if it? What if it was the law that you had to put your family on a reality show? You had reached a certain level of fame and success, and they had to, they, the Congress had to pass this law. What would what would it look like? I don't. Have, I'd have to. If I had a reality show, I'd be constantly telling the camera guy, "Shut the camera off." Because I wouldn't want to say what I was going to say on, on, on TV. I There'd could. be a lot of that. So, I, the, you know, with Instagram and Facebook and what have you, the, you're kind of doing a little reality show with, you know, showing some little clips of your right. life. And, and you do that. You. Yeah, every once in a while. And maybe, See, don't, I don't do any of that. Huh? No, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't think you were showing Right. What you're doing on a, on a daily. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you say it that way? You just say not the time. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're reading. I, I feel like it, it would, you know, I've had people, you know, say you really need to like uh, join the 21st century and Instagram. And I'm like, you know what? To, you know what the analogy to me is? Hugh Hefner, when he was in Chicago and when he was first in L.A., he never left the house. The house, the party came to him. Then, after his divorce from his second wife, um, he went out all the time. And you'd see him at like the Garden of Eden nightclub. And you're like, really? 
Hugh Hefner's here at the same fucking shithole <laughs> tit suit nightclub I'm at? Yeah. And it was so uncool. And I feel the same way about me and Instagram. Like, I feel like if I went on it, it would be like, it's like when you see a, a celebrity on the subway. <laughs> yeah. you know, and you're like, wow, Ethan Hawke, I thought you were doing better than this. You know, like, well, the, what the fuck are you doing on the subway? Man, do you need any help? You know, and I just, I feel like that's what it would be. So, I, pre- so I very appreciate you giving me that. You gave me a great, um, you know, sort of affirmation there. Well, that, there's, a, there's a mystique about it, too. It's like the fact that we don't know what the hell you're making for breakfast. <laughs> Exactly. It's kind of interesting yes. to me because it makes me wonder. Um, yes. Yeah, you know, it's for the same reason like Michael Jackson, when he when he started to do Thriller, he didn't want to do any interviews. He wanted to be elusive. And he didn't want to, you know, give people any private information about his life or what he was doing. So there's How ironic, said about <laughs> since, we, since we know he was fucking little boys. Uh, no, but like to not do any interviews or to not really show people the other side of you. Is uh is uh and plus you I just couldn't see you doing it anyway. It looked awkward. Right, and also what, one of the reasons I started this podcast is if you want to see what I'm doing when I'm just at home kicking it, this couldn't be more it. So <laughs> is know? this is this your vibe? Like, what do you do well, socially? I mean, you, you don't got no family. You got no. <laughs> <laughs> no I'm just. <laughs> You never sounded more Italian than that. Look, you got no family. This girl has no family. It's like she never even existed. All that would be left is our friendship. Uh, <laughs> I mean, are you, are you a dinner guy? You go out. Do you got buddies? Do you have friends? Like, what? What do you? I got a great life, really. If you knew what I was doing, you'd fucking kill yourself. <laughs> okay, let. I'm not. We're not going to get into details, but. It's, you know, it's Like, good. do you go out or do you just stay I, I, home? I, and... I went out Sunday night to the Elvis party at the Formosa. It was awesome. Thank you, Formosa, by the way. I signed their book. Um, yeah, I had an awesome time. Um, I don't go out to everything or uh, that p- p- appealed to me because it's Elvis. Um, but you're social. I'm not nearly as social as I used to. I certainly don't go out drinking like I used to. I mean, drinking was used to be a, a, a pursuit. It was like, what do you want to do? Was like that was the thing we're doing is we're going out drinking. And we'd go to different clubs and bars, and oh my god, I just, <laughs> I just, just thinking of it, I was like, what the fuck? But you know, that's life. You 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 evolve, and you look back, and you constantly think, what a dick. What was I doing? But you could you go back to, you know, 10 years old and, and say that, you know, I was thinking about baseball cards constantly. You know, I remember one year my aunt and uncle, they wanted to give me a present. You know, my birthday's in January. And I said, no, I want baseball cards. They don't come out till April. So I forewent an actual present to wait and get baseball cards because that was all I cared about. Well, I've changed a lot since then, you know, <laughs> and yeah, I, I and it's it's just interesting to look back when you were, were well past childhood and still be disappointed in yourself. Do you feel that? Uh, at 50, you can look back at 40 and go, Jesus, what a dick. Why was I doing that? And it's still 40. I mean, you were still a grown ass man. Do you ever do that? No. No? No, I don't have You were doing that. nothing bo- wrong at 40? No, I don't think I was doing anything. Oh, fuck I, I, you. Listen, <laughs> Who needs people like you? Well, I was. But that's, I mean, you know what? That's fine. I, first of all, I don't believe you. No, I was, nev- I was never like a trouble, uh, getting into trouble But there's guy. nothing you regret at 40. What ha- What was going on in your life 10 years ago? Uh, 10 years ago, I was just doing, I was, I was doing comedy. That's all I was doing was comedy. And when I was did, working at the Four Seasons married? Hotel. Uh, 10 years ago this this year. I just years. said what happened 10 years ago. You couldn't come up with that? It seems like a big one. Well, I mean, I, w- I wasn't going, what the hell am I doing? What's going on with me? I no, was... but, but 
if a guy asks you what you were doing 10 years ago and you go like, oh, geez, I think uh, well, I, I mean, did some clubs. And I, I, I was, oh, yeah, and I got married. A lot I of was, people say that's like the most important no, thing. My what? head was wrapped around okay, you were saying right. anything regret. So you, you know, got married 10 years. 10 years ago, I got married, yeah. So you obviously think that was a good move. It was a great move. Great okay. move. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to move the Rosado brothers out, <laughs> and then I'm going to get married. Great okay. move for me That's and right. my family. All right. Um, no, and then five years ago, I had my first child, and then I right. had another one. So you three. always wanted a, a wife and no, kids? No, I was like you. I was like, oh. I used to make fun of the, uh, in my act, I used to go, oh, oh the kids and this, and your kid's so great. And I'd go to a restaurant, and the kid's like, get this. Fuck. I, I, I had the same attitude. I, I was not a big kid guy. So you got married for the material? <laughs> well, over time, I'm like, you know what? You do get a lot of material, right? Oh, yeah. No, there's a lot of material. Right. Out of See, me. I don't have that kind of material. Well, I mean, you have other material. You have other other experiences that you're drawing. And a fucking life. And a, uh, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I know people love wives and children. I don't get it, but I know they do. Um, a lot of people pretend they do. Do you know that they did a, a survey fairly recently, and most people... A, a majority agreed with the line that the pollster asked, which was, um, I love my kids, but if I had to do it over again, I wouldn't. They told a pollster that. Well, well hey, listen. I'm just saying, how fucking desperate in your mind do you have to be a total stranger on the phone and you're revealing this? Well, that's, you got to look at the pool. Help who me. That, who, who's, who's I it? hate my fucking kids, whoever you are, over at uh, Gallup. But, I I mean, that's kind of a cry for help to say that to a well, stranger. I mean, look, at who, look at who's answering the phones on these things. I've had, I've, I've, I know no one. Who? I, I mean, someone's desperate enough to pick up the phone and talk to some stranger about their life. Right. I don't know nobody like that. No? So... The people I know, yeah, yeah. listen, I, some people are unhappy. It's a point well taken. Yeah, so um, it, it, some still, people are unhappy and some people okay. are happy. Let me, counselor, let me rephrase. Right. I've also heard anecdotally from people who said the same thing, like just people I know who said that same sentence, that I love my kids, uh, but if I had to do it over again. I wouldn't do it. Just because I think people raise kids wrong. Uh, I, I feel like I've heard you basically say the same thing. So, and in doing so, they, they not only ruin the kids' lives, but their life. When they're too indulgent, the kids grow up undisciplined and f basically feral, uneducated, terrible attitude, sense of entitlement. So they ruin their child. And then they also ruin their life mm -hmm. because... They don't have any fun because everything is about the kid, like like taxiing them everywhere and doing everything for them and apologizing to little children for bullshit that you do, like you should ever be doing that. All this shit ruins their life. All the money goes to the kid, whatever the kid wants. So, you know, that's if you're doing bucking it. that is is not an easy task. That's if, that, that's if you're doing it that way, which is the wrong way. I know, but kids talk to other kids. It's hard to not be infected by it. You certainly must have found that out already with how old is the oldest? Five, five and a half, going to be okay. six. It's going to get worse. Uh, listen, I, I know, <laughs> listen, there's going to be challenges, but I got my kids making their bed in the morning. They're getting an, a little allowance. I'm good. trying to teach them about right. money. Good. Well, good. This is why I got anxiety. This is why I'm constantly thinking. And why? Because you're worried that you're, you're going to ruin your kids? No, I, I'm, I just want to be present and I want to do it right. And there's a lot of pressure right. with, with a lot of, like you're saying, you outside all, factors that I want to like, give them like a good foundation. When you're on, like, for example, when you're on the road and, like, and there's some, something your kid is, has going on at home, you wish you could be not on the road. but Yeah, I'm like, what am I doing in Montana? You know, <laughs> sometimes that's what I think. Like, should I be home giving them the proper guidance they need? I mean, my wife's fantastic, but also I, I add another layer of parenting to what we're trying to do. Well, we sent you to Montana to take over the numbers business, okay? Now, the Rosado brothers have been running it, but they've been running it badly. We're going to bring in the Roadhouse boys just for a piece. 
Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Sometimes, yes, I come, you, you make know, me. That's another thing. You know, movie lines. I don't, like what the? F that wasn't a movie. I know, but it? even like you, you, you did like the whole <laughs> senator thing, and I'm like, this guy knows the senator's speech from oh. from Godfather too. Well, it's like not normal. I mean, yeah. like a lot of people don't do that. I should know it better. I mean, if I really, <laughs> if I really knew it, it would be great. With the accent. Right. I mean, that's, that's, you know. Oh, well. I don't know, I don't know a lot of movies. Well, that's, lines. see, now there's a good example of something that you would never see on real time. It's just not that kind of show. But it is what you would see of me at home, which gets back to why I'm not an Instagram. Because this is Instagram. This is your Instagram. Kids, just chop it up into three second <laughs> <laughs> clips. Uh, if that doesn't tax your attention span. Because, I mean, you know, we, we have, how about, you must be worried. You want some anxiety with your kids. You must be worried about what the, the fucking phone, yes. the portal to evil, mm -hmm. and social media, and TikTok, mm -hmm. and how that is rotting and has rotted the brain yeah. of our youth. Yeah. And how, how are you, you going to protect your kids from that? Well, I'm going to, well, this is what, we try and do things outside the house, activities, what have you. Screen time is not something that we're always doing. But what, how old was your, how old when they get a phone? I want to. I want to do that. Like, like when they get a license, right? But you know. see, this is going to be very hard to hold the line when that kid goes to school and the other kids have phones. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. This is going to pit you against the the horror of where America is now with this kind of nonsense. My sister and I talk about this all the time. If the parents got on board with one <laughs> another, we wouldn't have a problem. So when Tommy's parents giving the kid a phone at nine, you got to go to Tommy's parents going, what are you doing? You're, you're, you're screwing up the whole vibe here. If everybody kind of waited to a certain age, we wouldn't have to be competing with other families when, when it comes to these phones. And a lot of these parents, they don't care. It's just, it's, give them the phone. I don't want to be dealing with this kid. And, and the kind of phone raises them. And it's not really my style. It's not what I'm trying to achieve with my kids. So you're going to take care of this thing? I'm going to take care of it. We're going to have thing, a meeting. The thing and... we talked about. <laughs> you know, the thing about the guy? Yeah. The guy, who, the guy who's gone, right? <laughs> <laughs> that guy. <laughs> I love the way they talk in their code, right? Yeah. Did you uh, ever know anybody uh, who was connected? Or no, my father worked in the hair business, still does. He's a hairstylist, and my mother was a secretary. We didn't really play around in the uh, right. mob circles. I mean, we grew no, up in the I, northwest suburbs of Arlington Heights in, in, in Chicago. I, there was really no... I uh, was not casting as... Per, I was <laughs> no, not... No, no, I mean, there I, was no... I, I know. It's not like, you know, no. may, may, maybe you would think or someone would think, oh, you're Italian, you know, did, you, did you come across any, uh, you know, heavy it hitters just, growing just, up? Sometimes when you, the way you speak, you'll come to a sentence and it will just force me to... <laughs> <laughs> talk like another mobster from any one of many mob movies. I've, we haven't even gotten to Goodfellas. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, but no. Uh, there's no, there's no, no encounters. I, I know. I am not, not that. World. I am not that person who thinks that uh, all Italian Americans are in the mafia, and they had good reason to be uh, upset about that. I mean, that's part of the subplot of the making of The Godfather. Did yeah. you see that? Uh, oh, it was, uh, I think, a Paramount uh, Yeah, the uh, Offer. The Offer. Did yeah, you yeah. watch that? I watched it. It was fascinating. I thought it was fantastic. Yeah. Really. I have no reason to plug this fucking thing. It's on a competing network. <laughs> but it really was. Yeah. I really, I, I, and I became a, a Miles Teller. Teller fan mm -hmm. from that. Before that, he just kind of like always played boys, I thought. And then it's like, oh. Oh, there's a real, there's a man there. And uh, Hollywood needs more of those kind of sturdy actors. Like in the day, it was like, you know, Spencer Tracy. Mm. You know, not some matinee idol looking guy, just a pair of balls, hit your mark and bark, <laughs> you know, and a sense of integrity yeah. about him. Don't you think that's no. lacking? Well, well, I mean, that's society, though. You know, I, think, I think it reflects the times, you know. Now, that's interesting. You're, Back then, you had people with balls, and now it doesn't right. seem to be that way. And listen, I'm hoping it comes back and cyclical, and maybe we'll see that time again. But 
I don't know. I mean, you know, you're a dying breed and, uh, <laughs> meaning <laughs> thoughtful. Me, yeah. I mean, just old, <laughs> which no, ones, what do you say? Soon. Um, um, no, well, I, mean, I tell you, I may be dying, but until I am, I'm going to be living. <laughs> well, that's you're um, certainly living. Yeah. No, well, it's good to meet you. Yeah, I was always well, curious about you. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate you having me on. When my oh. my sister is a huge fan of yours, and uh, she was like, "Well, oh my God, you're doing a show." It's, she's she's beside herself. So, and and she's connected. She's connected. Yeah. <laughs> she's in the mob. And I she's... love the way you didn't deny it for one <laughs> second. You just went completely with that. So, do you have anything to plug? Well, I do a podcast myself. I do two. Let's do plug. Yeah. I am in Las Vegas at the David Copperfield Theater. Oh, shit, they got me doing magic now. All right, whatever it takes to stay in show business. That's what the guy said when he was shoveling the shit behind the elephant. Remember that old yeah. joke? What, and leave show business? Okay, February 17th, 18th. Uh, yeah, moving over to the MGM. That's very exciting. And Albuquerque, January 28th. Uh, at the Kiva Auditorium. Oh, I've been there. Have you been? You must have played the Kiva Auditorium in Albuquerque. No, I never played no? Albuquerque. No, I don't think never so. played Albuquerque. Uh, I might have played a casino there, but not a. Not a thing. What do you got against Albuquerque? I got nothing against it. <laughs> it's just there's not a lot of Italians there. <laughs> oh, it's it's not somebody else's territory, is it, Sebastian? We wouldn't yeah, want to stay out of that. Territory uh, very. We don't want to start a war. No. It's bad blood. You need them every 10 years. Cleans out the bad blood. But, okay. but what are your plugs? What are my plugs? Um, just the Pete and Sebastian show. It's a podcast. I do another comedian, Pete Corielli. Yes. And uh, Daddy versus Doctor. I got a, uh, you'll love this. I'm doing, <laughs> my pediatrician and I hooked up. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing a podcast, basically taking callers questions in regards to uh, their kids and and pediatrics and he provides like medical advice and i kind of provide the humor but so, families are off limits right families are off limits families are always off limits. families kids and wives we don't touch can, them horse's head that's fine how about that scene what a great scene that house is actually down the street did you know that is that right yeah it's the way they the, shot that yeah it looks familiar. I bet you they used it for a, a thousand things when they want that, like, super, like, baller oh, yeah, it's, of an era. I look. went to go look at it. There was for sale. Not that I was going to buy it at all. I just was so curious about the house that we went to just go take a walk around the grounds. It's literally down. This, really, if you go down this street, it's uh, on your right-hand side, about a mile down. I love the way Tom Hagen never loses his temper in that scene. When the guy's ranting and raving and... He, Thank you for a lovely evening. Now, if you'll have your car, take me back to the airport. Mr. Corleone is a man who insists on hearing bad news immediately. He never, like, fights back while well, the guy is ranting and raving. And she was the greatest piece of ass I've ever had. <laughs> Just to show you, it's not all about dollars and cents. And then Johnny Fontaine comes along with his olive oil charm and made me look ridiculous. And a man in my position can't afford to look ridiculous. Now you get out of here! And you tell if any of those goombas come out of the woodwork. That's this the way is, I say goodbye to all my this guests. This is unheard of, guys. Oh, so are you are you are you listening to this back there? This is amazing. This guy. Tell your Italian <laughs> friends I'm available for parties. I can do all the oh, man. mafia. I, I feel like we dialogue. did full circle from Mob Week to this. It's just. It, <laughs> oh yes, Mob Week. You're right. You're right. I met your mob, mob week. week that we met, and the whole thing was about mob. I forgot that. <laughs> it must be the pot. <laughs> Are you sure you don't want to try pot? No, no, no. I'm okay. Good. I'm good. Well, I think right. I got enough from, from what you were doing. <laughs> yeah. Stephen A. Smith was just telling me that he thinks when he was here, he got a contact high. And uh, I, I don't really think there's such a thing as a contact high. But you know what? I'm so used to pot, it probably... I need more. <laughs> I know. I, I mean, not like a crazy mind. I didn't even finish that giant stogie. Um, but do you, do you sleep well? Yeah. Why? What'd you hear? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh, basically, I mean, like, you know, as well as I did when I was 24, absolutely not. I mean, you have more things on your mind. It's harder to turn your mind off. Um, you get up once in the night to pee, once if you're lucky. Yeah. Uh, I know people who do it more. But... Um, you know, do you do you sleep well? Do you, you can you turn off your mind or is that an analytical mm, it's, thing? It's, it's on. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's on. It's on. Yeah, 
I, I mean, I have to get into bed like a couple hours before I'm asleep, like an hour of watching TV and an hour of probably just lying in bed before I fall asleep, you know. But I do it, God damn it. I do it. Oh, good for I, you. Because you have to get your sleep. Oh, absolutely. Um, so anyway, pleasure. Pleasure, uh, brother. Now that I know, know well, you listen, live right up the road. Give me a call. Come down here and uh, um, you come up there. I, I got I, kids, though, so maybe I, I come down here. Yeah, maybe you can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the kids are five and two. Three, yeah. Yeah, you come down here. <laughs> come down. All right.